Okay. So this is chapter 40, Second Coming and Its Consequences. Consequence. Oh, I didn't read it. Okay. Consequence. What are we talking about? Anyway. Second Coming, chapter 40. <clears throat> if you look at uh, Apostles' Creed or any of the creeds of the church, it will always talk about the coming of Jesus Christ in judgment. The phrasing will come out in different kinds of ways, uh, but it, in one of the old King James type thing, he comes to judge the quick and the dead. And it's kind of funny, like, okay, dead people don't move, but if you're really quick, you can avoid judgment or something like that. But the idea of Jesus coming back, his return, is one of those very, very, very important doctrines. And it's in all the creeds, it's in all the teachings. So let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, one of the things we see is that Jesus will come back. So if I look at Matthew chapter 26, uh, this is uh, quite a story. Uh, because what's happening here, Jesus in Matthew 26, Jesus is in front of the high priest, and there in front of the high priest, uh, the man says, uh, the high priest asks him, Our, uh, this is 2663, I drew you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. I mean, just lay it right on the line. And Jesus said, you have said so. So he's accepting, yes, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he goes this, but I tell you, from now on, you will see a man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his robes. You've uttered blasphemy. What is he doing here? You're going to see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God, and you're going to see this messianic return of Jesus coming. Uh, and, and the high priest, realizing that he's speaking about judgment to him, is saying, oh my gosh, you're talking about me, and that's exactly right. A look at Acts chapter 1. So Acts 1, uh, Luke begins his history here by talking about uh, the kingdom, then he gives the command to take the gospel to the whole world, verse 8. In verse 9, while he said this thing, they were looking up, he was lifted up and a cloud took them out of their sight. Okay, that's the ascension of Jesus. They're gazing into heaven. Behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And then here you in verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? So, wow, he went up there. Why do you stand looking in heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Now, there are any details there, but he went up and he is going to come back. Uh, that picture of return of Christ is there very strongly. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll just not look at all the passages, we'll look at some of them. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 1 Thessalonians 1.10 uh, Talking about people who have turned from God to God from idols and serve the living and true God and were waiting for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers from the wrath to come. So it's connecting the coming of the Son with wrath to come, God's day of judgment. Second uh, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, uh, chapter one, starting at verse seven, talking about a day when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel, those suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from. But in verse ten, that comes the day to be glorified in His saints be marveled about who would believe because our testimony believed. And that's, that's, that's the day we're looking for, is that day of the, the certainty, the definiteness of his coming. He will return. Uh, and it's a, it's a for sure kind of thing. Now the question is, when? Uh, we've had all kinds of predictions in my lifetime. Being an old man, I've seen a number of these. I remember in 1988, I was here at the seminary and there's a book that came out that was very popular, Eight or Eight Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. 
And so one of the TV stations came out and interviewed me about this particular book, uh, thinking I'd probably that I would be a support of it, and I wasn't. I, I didn't mock it, but I sure tried to say, mm, I don't think so. And the things he was appealing to, the founding of Israel in 1948, 44 years later in 1980, I said, I don't think so. And I tried carefully to unplug hope from that. And uh, of course it didn't happen. The guy published a sequel. Oh my gosh, I missed the math. It's 89 reasons why he's coming in 89. And somehow that book didn't sell at all. There are all kinds of predictions. What does Jesus say about this? Uh, well, one of the things is people appeal to be signs. And when we look in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus leaves the temple there, and people, the disciples, are looking at the temple, and he says, this is all coming down. Not one stone is going to be left. He's talking about the day of destruction of the temple. The sound of the Mount of Olives, the Jesus the disciples asking privately, tell us, when will these things be? What is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, this is a, a challenging passage, but let me give you a picture of what I think it's saying here. Uh, He's saying, first of all, there are two questions here in Matthew 24. The first one is, when will these things be? And he's talking now about the destruction of the temple and the things around that. And that's the first question. The second question is, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So they're expecting the coming of Christ. And then what he says in verse 4, I won't go through the whole thing, but uh, he says, so see that no one leads you astray, for many will come saying, I am the Christ, and will lead you astray. So we have an antichrist, false Christ. You have wars, rumors of wars. And his thing is, when you see this happen, don't panic. Don't panic. Uh, this must take place, but this is not the end. So you see these things happening, instead of saying, get ready, it's ready, you're almost here. No, no, he says, don't calm down. This is not the end. Uh, nation rise against nation, came to the kingdom, there'll be famine, earthquakes, there'll be, and he said, but these are just the beginning of the birth pangs. So, and then he goes on. The tribulation, you'll be hated by nations, many will fall away, false prophets, their lawlessness will increase, love will go cold. And verse 13 is another command, the one who endures to the end will be saved. So calm down, don't panic. This isn't the end. Stay faithful, endure to the end. And in verse 14, the gospel of kingdom we preach. Preach on, be faithful. Of course, that's the message of the whole thing. So when he's talking about this, he's saying, calm down, stay faithful, keep doing kingdom work. And then it says the gospel of kingdom we proclaim throughout the whole world as a testimony of all nations and then the end will come. Well, now the amazing thing is, when you read the rest of the scripture, the destruction of the temple came 40 years later, 70 AD, and by the time of the destruction of the temple, the gospel had been preached in the entire known world. Now, we're not talking about Mayans in Central America because that's not the known world that he's referring to here, it seems to me. But amazingly enough, this little ragtag group of disciples within 40 years, had taken the gospel to the entire known world. Uh, I think that's what he's talking about. Now he goes on, the abomination of desolation. That's when Titus walks into the temple. Uh, when you see this happen, flee, do that. Great tribulation. Uh, there'll be false Christ, prophets. All this happened in that first generation. Uh, then in 27, he quotes from Isaiah 13, lightning comes east and shine as far as the west, so becoming the son of man. Uh, sorry, 29 is, is the quote. The tribulation from those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give us light. That's from Isaiah 13. It's talking about the destruction of Babylon. This is apocalyptic language told in cosmic dramatic terms that says the whole world is changing. And that's what happened in the destruction of Babylon. In Isaiah 13, this language is a, the destruction of Babylon. So what's destroyed here? Jerusalem. 
And he's saying here, Jerusalem has become Babylon and God is going to destroy it. This isn't talking about some, <clears throat> some yet future cosmological thing, seems to me. This is talking about apocalyptic way of, this is dramatic. Uh, the Son of Man coming on the clouds with heaven and great glory. Look back in Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel 7, 13 and 14 is not a second coming passage, it's an enthronement passage. This is when Messiah comes up to the Ancient of Days and is given the Messianic kingdom, and then you go and do the kingdom work. This isn't second coming in Daniel 7, it's actually enthronement. This is the exaltation of Messiah to the right hand of the Father. So it seems to me then that he says here in verse 34, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Let's talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. And that all happens in those 40 years. And what he's giving is very specific. This is going to happen. It will happen in this generation. And it does. But then he goes on, verse 36, concerning that day, no one knows the time. Uh, in the days of Noah will be the coming of the Son of Man. Life will be going on. Suddenly things will come. and You get a chapter and a half of ways to be prepared for the day of the second coming. And nobody knows when that's happening. Nobody knows when that. Not even Jesus knows the date of the second coming when he's here on earth. So we have the definiteness of his second coming. But we have the we don't know when of the second coming. And that picture is, you know, let's just forget about the date setting. Let's just forget it. What it does say in Acts chapter 1 is it's going to be a personal coming. Jesus is going to come back. We get the same thing in Revelation 19. It's going to be physical and bodily, just like he had disappeared in bodily form. He's going to return in bodily form. Uh, it's going to be visible. There's going to be trumpets and everybody's going to see it. It's going to be triumphant and glorious. And it's going to be a return of judgment. Look at Matthew chapter 25 now. Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels are with him, and then he will sit on his glorious throne, and he'll gather all the nations, and he'll separate sheep and goats. Did I get it right? No, goats are on the left. Goats and sheep. I uh, and he says, come to your blessed by your father, inherit the kingdom. And he's talking about the sheep that are on the right. And he says, I was hungry, you gave me food. Thirsty, you gave me drink. Stranger, you welcomed me. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. What's he talking about here? He's talking about people who are concerned about God's righteousness, which means to care for the weak and the oppressed, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the poor, the prisoner. And if we have the part of Messiah, if we're regenerate, we will care about those people. So the judgment isn't you're saved by works. The judgment is do your works show that you have the regenerate heart, that the Holy Spirit does? Do you have the character and the love of Jesus? And if you care about, quote-unquote, worthless people, if you care about troubled people, uh, sick people or imprisoned people, and if we care about people whose situation is different than ours, uh, that's a good thing. The righteous will say, when did we see you like this? And he said, truly, when you did these to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So when you care about the widow, the orphan, the sick, the imprisoned, we're caring for Jesus. And that's the heart of Jesus coming out. Now, of course, the goats on the left is depart from me, because you didn't care. Again, is that salvation by works? No, but the works demonstrate whether you have that regenerate heart or not. And the, the end of this, verse, 26, verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment and the righteous into eternal life. We'll unpack that a little bit further in, in a future lesson. But this return of Jesus, it's certainly going to happen. We certainly don't know when it's going to happen. We certainly need to be prepared for it to happen. And we need to be faithful until it happens. 
what does that faithfulness look like? It means do God's kingdom work. It means to proclaim and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. No matter where you are, no matter what kind of condition you're in, you can live that gospel. Thank you.